Hello, my name is Matthew Davis, and today I'm going to be discussing our research into site suitability for dry farm vegetable production. I was lucky to be able to work with Alex Stone, the OSU Vegetable Research Specialist, Amy Garrett of Small Farms, and Andy Gallagher of Red Hill Soils on this project. We also worked with 28 farmer collaborators to come up with this data. The project was funded by the USDA Risk Management Agency Education Partnership Program and Western SARE. The project occurred over two years, the summers of 2018 and 2019. Each year, we had about 20 farms in the study, and you can see here in this map, the uh, blue dots are farms that were in both years, and then the red dots were farms that were only in one year of the study. For each of these farms, site variables were characterized, and weekly harvests of tomato and a single harvest of squash were collected and used as our response data. And then we related these yield and fruit quality um, response variables to the site variables that we characterized. And we did this for three reasons. First, we wanted to better understand what makes a site suitable for dry farming. We also wanted to help farmers determine if their Willamette Valley site was suitable for dry farm vegetable production. And finally, we wanted to be able to determine whether some sites on a farm were better suited for dry farming than others. We found that two factors were responsible for uh, dry farming outcomes. They were climate and soil. We'll discuss both of these in a little bit of depth now. So first, let's talk about climate. Climate is temperature, humidity, wind, all these things. And they're important because they drive evapotranspiration. They drive evaporation of water from these pores on the leaves called stomata. You can imagine when it's very hot and dry, the plants are gonna release more water than when it's cool and humid. If you consider both temperature and relative humidity together, you can derive a value known as vapor pressure deficit, which is how dry the air is. Here is a heat map of the west coast, and you can see on the right here, we have the different colors or different vapor pressure deficits. And this is the 30 year averages. So this is what a typical year looks like. You can see in the Willamette Valley here, the average is about 18 to 26, which is, you know, fairly moderate. If you look down at coastal California though, where most commercial dry farming of tomatoes has historically occurred, you can see the vapor pressure deficit is lower though. It's between eight and 14. And this makes a difference. You know, this is gonna drive plant water use. However, not all years are like the normal. Um, so this is the heat map from 2018. And you can see that the air was a lot drier in 2018. Uh, and this resulted in lower yields compared to a more typical year like 2019. Now, unfortunately, if you're in the Willamette Valley or in Eastern Oregon or on the coast, there's not much you can do to change your climate. Um, but one thing that you can do is you can manipulate your microclimate using uh, things like sheltering and changing your site architecture. Some site features can help to shelter your crop from the wind and sun, and by sheltering your crop from these elements, you can reduce evapotranspiration. One thing you can use is trees. So here's a picture of one of our sites in Eugene, um, and just you know, it's protected by trees and it had a uh, very low blossom end rot and the highest unblemished yield of all of our sites. So um, sheltering definitely seems to help with blossom end rot and also with fruit size. Um, you can plant hedgerows, you could use windbreaks, you can use buildings. Another thing is solar panels. So this is one of our other sites where um, we have solar panels and they also protect the plants from, from wind and from irradiance. Now that we've talked a bit about climate, let's talk about soil. Soil is important because it holds water and nutrients for the plant. Soil is the major water storage reservoir of terrestrial ecosystems. It's where plants get water. Even if you have irrigation, the water needs to go into the soil before the plants can take it up. Soil is filled by precipitation, like rain, and it's emptied by evapotranspiration, which is the combination of evaporation from the soil and transpiration by plants. And again, transpiration is that evaporation from those pores called stomata. And in the soil, water is stored between soil particles. Now, in understanding their, your soils, the first thing to know is that there are these things called soil horizons. Soil horizons are layers parallel to the soil surface with distinct physical, chemical, and biological properties to the soil above and below. So you can see here on the right is a picture of a soil profile down to five feet. 
And you can see it changes as you go down. So this bottom horizon, the C horizon, looks very different from that top AP horizon. Horizons are distinguished by physical characteristics like changes in texture and color. And again, you can see the top of the soil is that darker, earthier um, color, and then the bottom is more of that yellow, orange color. Identifying soil horizons is the first step in understanding the soil profile. Now Andy's going to tell us a little bit about how he breaks up soil horizons. I've separated the soil into soil horizons. This is what we call the plow layer, or the AP. This is the AB, where we have a transition from the surface to the subsoil. This is the BW, and this is the BW2. The next thing to consider is water holding capacity. Water holding capacity is the amount of plant available water that a soil can hold. Soils of different textures have different available water holding capacities. So you can see in this table here, on the left we have different soil texture classes from sands to sandy loams to silt loams to silty clay loams. And you can see as the um, texture changes, so does the water holding capacity, inches per inch. So sands have the lowest, uh, 0 0.05. And silt loams and silt clay loams have the highest available water holding capacity, 0.2 to 0.24. Available water holding capacity for the whole soil is calculated by taking the depth of each of these horizons and their texture. So you can see at the very top here, we have the AP horizon, 0 to 9 inches. It's a silt loam. If we know silt loams contain 0.2 inches of available water holding capacity per inch, then we multiply 0.2 by 9 and we get 1.8 inches in that first um, horizon. And luckily for us, the Willamette Valley has many deep silt loam soils that are excellent for dry farming. So next, Andy's gonna tell us a bit about how he determines uh, soil texture. So the, the next thing I'm gonna look at is the soil texture. That's the relative amounts of sand, silt, and clay. And the way we do that is with, we call it hand texturing. So I, I moisten up a, a sample of soil and then I work it up really well with my hands, try and turn it into a putty. And then I'll make, I try and make a ribbon. And there you can see I, I can make a pretty good ribbon with this soil. And I'm guessing this has around 30% clay. So what you see is the textural triangle, which allows us to take the percentage of clay, silt, and sand and come up with a name for the soil texture. In this example, we have about 30% clay, and we don't have very much sand, probably between 10 and 20% sand. So that puts us in the silty clay loam texture. We have 60, 70% silt in this sample. And so why, why take the texture of the soil? Well, the texture of the soil, the uh, percent sand, silt, and clay, affects the particle size distribution, which is very closely controls the available water holding capacity of the soil. And in a dry farm uh, situation, the only water that's available to the crop is the water that's stored in the soil. And so it's important to know what the available water holding capacity of the soil is. Uh, for this Chehalis silty clay loam, this profile in the top five feet can hold about a foot of water. And then a final soil property that we found um, appears to relate to dry farming success is soil consistency. Soil consistency is defined as the relative ease with which a soil can be ruptured or deformed and is determined by applying pressure to a soil pad. So you can see in the picture on the bottom here, Friable soils break very easily, whereas firm soils take a lot of pressure before they break. If we look at the right here, at this soil profile again, we can see that there's this very firm to firm uh, layer in the middle of the profile. And this part of the soil uh, profile might make this whole soil perform more poorly. So we found that having these firm layers is associated with reduced yields. Now Andy's going to tell us a bit about how he determines soil consistency. And now we're going to look at the soil consistence, uh, the rupture resistance of the soil aggregates. And this is something that we're, we're looking at being important in terms of response to dry farming. 
So here's a surface sample I have, and I'll, I'll take a soil pad. Generally you want a pad that's about an inch, but we don't have any of that coarse in the surface, so I'll take about a half inch one and just squeeze it. And it this just crumbles under very gentle finger pressure. And so we consider that to be friable. Uh, friable is a good word if you're a farmer. You want your soil to be friable. Here's a subangular block about an inch or three-quarter inch diameter from the subsoil and it's a little bit more firm but still not all that firm. As the soil dries out this will become much harder to do and so we will consistently moisten it up before we determine the consistency of the soil. So there you have it. You now know that site suitability is related to climate and soil. In particular, climate, you want to look out for temperature, humidity, and wind speed. And with your soils, you're mostly interested in available water holding capacity and the presence of firm layers. All right, there you have it. Thank you for watching. Um, this project was put together by Alex Stone in the Department of Horticulture, Amy Garrett in the Small Farms Program, and Andy Gallagher of Red Hill Soils. And now I can answer some questions. Great. Um, so I think that Andy and Alex are here. Um, if you uh, all want to unmute um, as well to help answer questions. Um, there is a question already in the chat box. Um, let's see, did the research done as part of this study look into the effectiveness of cover crop mixes to reduce evaporation in addition to helping build organic matter in the soil, which over time would presumably increase the soil water holding capacity? Um, I, I can answer this question. Uh, and, and the answer is no, unfortunately. You know, we didn't really look into grower practices. Um, the way that this experiment was conducted uh, statistically, um, more on my end of it, was we took the, the site data, things like the depth of these firm horizons, the uh, water holding capacity of the soil, and then we just correlated those to those yield variables. So, you know, it's, it's hard to, I mean, even looking at something as simple as like available water holding capacity, you know, because there are so many different variables to consider, it can be kind of hard to, to find these correlations. And, and I think the fact that we did see these correlations uh, really speaks to how much of an effect available water holding capacity is having. But unfortunately, you know, this wasn't as much an experiment looking at, you know, farmer methods. And if we had included, you know, those sorts of, of um, factors, they probably would have been drowned out by, you know, just the, uh, the, sh the, uh, the impact of effective available water holding capacity, that that is such an important variable. Um, that, that's, you know, it, it, you could potentially do something on each site where you, you looked at, you know, the site and you had a, you had one plot that had some sort of cover crop treatment and one plot that didn't. And then you could see, you know, is this a consistent effect of these cover crops over, you know, all these different sites, but, but unfortunately we weren't able to do that. Did you have anything well, to add, Andy? I would just add use cover crops. <laughs> we didn't look at that, but it's a great practice. So there's, there's no reason not to use cover crops regularly. All right. Hi, this is Ella Page. I, I have a quick question. The former guest before lunch um, with the Trinity tomato, uh, the gentleman, the farmer who was growing the tomatoes, he mentioned something called the edge effect. And he believed that his productivity on the farm um, was going to be better than, say, productivity in the backyard garden because apparently the edges of competing vegetation were going to take the nutrients away. That's what he seemed to be by implication. So I'm curious, given what we just heard about water, um, that, you know, maybe could I get a response in terms of how that may play in, how the edge effect that the former guest mentioned might play into the water availability in the soil. Uh, and just as an aside, what I did this year in my garden to prep it for this year is I had, I had rows with grass in my backyard. I actually covered all the rows of grass with heavy mulch of leaves. And that's, in other words, I'm killing the grass so they're not acting like straws. My theory is, or hypothesis is, they're not acting as straws to draw up water and not competing for nutrients. So 
once again, that's what I'm doing practically to try to test that idea. Well, edge effect that he's that he's referring to, I, I'm not exactly sure what he meant, but generally it'd be the competition from the, the adjacent vegetation, whether it's trees, which can, from my experience, send roots clear across your garden, uh, depending on the species of tree, and they can suck up a lot of water. And then you also have shade, which can work for you or against you, depending on what the crop is. We found some benefit to having some shade uh, on certain in certain situations, and Matthew can talk about the shade effect, but the edge effect, I think, mainly is competition from the side. Plus, that's where the bunnies hide. And then uh, we have time for one more question before the next research update. Uh, and there's just a question about, has there been any consideration uh, in applying uh, dry farming techniques to the urban uh, setting? So container farming, gardening, Pacific Island region. Yeah, we, we worked with um, a few uh, urban garden sites um, and they seem to do pretty well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of diversity in, in what sort of soils exist under urban sites. One, so the site that I showed you in Eugene, that was a Malabon soil. That was the soil that Steve Solomon mentioned as being one of his favorites for dry gardening. Um, in Portland, uh, our soil there, a Multnomah, and it, it actually has a lot of gravel and that makes the water holding capacity really low. Um, but at the same time, it was really shady there and, and the shade and the potential effect that that might have on, on wind speeds running through the sheltering made it so that even though they had low yields because of their low water holding capacity, the fruit there, um, they had very little blossom and rot and the fruit were relatively large. Um, you know, it's just, it can be this whole amalgamation of factors that influences the crop and, and whether you're in an urban setting or, or a, a rural setting, um, one of the interesting things is we do we did seem to find that the principles seem to hold across all these different sites, you know, that that things like available water holding capacity were important, you know, whether you were in an urban or, or in a, a rural setting. Okay, maybe while you're queuing up for the next um, research update, Matt, I, I just want to uh, say additionally that, um, you know, uh, if you think of our like our root zone or the soil that we're growing in, whether it be um, a container or a field, uh, if your volume of soil is small, then um, the amount of water that's gonna be hold there is less. So the idea of uh, dry farming in a container sounds pretty, is pretty, pretty limiting in that way. <laughs> 